<laughs> hey, good morning. Did you see all my animation, everyone? Uh, good morning. Welcome to Trail Talk. We are here at the Chisholm Trail Heritage Center in Duncan, Oklahoma, and that's right. It's morning, not afternoon. I hope I get through this with only one cup of coffee. Yeah. Um, anyway, I want to introduce you to my friend, Mike Larson. He's a new friend, and I'm so pleased to be able to introduce you to him. He is our current featured artist here at the Heritage Center, and his works will be on display and for sale until the end of the year. So you have plenty of time to come by and see these amazing works. But before we show you those, let's get to know this amazing man. So Mr. Mike, and oh, I, I was talking to his wife, Martha, who is in the, she's trying to stay far away, but we're hoping to get her in front of the camera at some point. Yeah, she's waving us off, but we'll see. We'll see, won't we? Okay. so. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Mike, because I've read your history. I've taught about you before during some of our sessions, and you're kind of an Oklahoma transplant. Trans Is that right? I was born in Dallas. I am um, my mother and my brother and I moved up to Winnipeg, Oklahoma, uh, shortly after I was born. Uh, and we lived in Winnipeg, Jeepers, I guess, until I uh, was in Virginia, you know. Early junior high, second okay. grade, okay. and we moved to Amarillo and with, with, with my new stepfather, oh, okay. which where he's not my name, Larson. He was Danish. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I moved from Texas to Oklahoma, back to Texas. Okay. Back to Oklahoma. Back to Oklahoma, where he resides now. He picked, he picked, you know, of course he picked Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> and so during all of those growing up years, were you a doodler or did you always have a kind of a, a draw, no pun intended, but were you always kind of drawn to doing art? Was that in you? I think so. We, we, my mother uh, had, until she died, and we have some of these now, drawings that I did in grade school and junior high, uh -huh. going into high school. Uh, and it was in high school that I really developed an interest in art uh, when I was a senior in high school. Nifty little bitty, nothing a story, but I took an art class in high school last semester because I needed an easy credit. Oh, yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> we've always been, we've all, all been there. Uh, and I was really lucky, as were many of us, because our instructor, Oh, had other things to do because he would take roll and leave and be back in 50 minutes to make sure we were all still there. Right, right. But in that class, we had access to materials that I had never had access to before. Really good charcoal, really good paint, really good paper, uh, things like that. So I was able to take advantage of those basically on my own. Just me and the other students. And so we formed some of us a little bitty club, like whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, in that art class. Uh, and I think it turned out some nifty little drawings and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and luckily, we did not do like some of the students did, go down to the end of the wing and smoke cigarettes. And right. Not do any of Right. You, it, so that really pulled you in. And it's interesting you mentioned access to really good materials. I never really thought about that. I bet that can really it can help, help with your creativity it, and just yes, it can really, really help. And, and I learned early on, I don't remember from which instructors or whatever, that if you have an opportunity to buy one really good brush instead of 10 for them, mm -hmm. buy the one. Really? Uh, and and um, my stepfather, bless his heart, uh, thought he was really doing me a favor when I was in the fall junior high high school and bought me a hundred brushes. But he bought those hundred brushes for a dollar. They both come in, he was so proud. Uh, and so, what are you going to do? I was a kid, I was not proud, and, and made it shown. Uh, but you know, I can't. Right, right, exactly. But that's the kind of thing when I 
did teach, and we have I have taught in the 80s, 1980s for years and 12 years of uh, classes in Oklahoma City. Uh, and that was one of the biggest things I tried to teach people was to buy really, really quality material. Mm -hmm. Don't buy cheap paint. Mm -hmm. uh, don't buy cheap paper. It never works, never lasts. Uh, and you buy a tube of cheap paint, you'll be much stronger than white. And then so buy all the best. Right. Right. So like I'll marry the best. <laughs> so so as a struggling artist, how does one do that? I, you know what I mean? I, I feel like that's kind of an investment, right? In those materials. It is. Uh, and and uh, you become a little more selective in what you do. Okay. Uh, you know, not that I was careless or people are careless or anything like that. But I think selective is a good word to use. Uh, when you're looking at people to paint, you don't just paint anybody. You are selective in who you paint. Mm -hmm. There were people here last month that I wish I could have sit down and mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter. Right, right. Well, uh, that's okay. So that, that kind of helps me, uh, you know, get that in my head a little bit. So you're that, and that in turn helps fund your. Purchase, yeah, is uh, that what yeah, you're kind of saying? Yeah, yeah. There's uh, an end result of it. You paint with better quality materials, people who buy art can tell. Uh, and don't ever, uh, again, I'm talking, don't ever under underestimate the knowledge of your customers. Mm -hmm. They will look at a painting and quickly determine whether or not it is worth a second look. And a lot of that is they were able to determine whether or not you have used materials that they will be able to keep. They're going to buy, they'll be able to keep it for a long time and pass it on. Uh, you buy, produce cheap things, cheap things happen. Right, right. And people invest in art. I mean, it's it, sometimes it, it really is that for them, it's an investment yes. or it is something that they want to pass on. Yes, and to the, their family. those people will come back. Right. Right. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if a person buys a painting, takes it home and looks at the back of it and, and sees how cheaply we've done, did not have done, mm -hmm. been done, they won't come back. Mm -hmm. They'll go somewhere else. Right. Too many people producing good art, uh, and there are a lot of them out there. That, that um, you know, competition is fierce. Yeah. So you have to be on the top all the time. All the time. You always have to bring your A game. Yes. That's, well, and I think that's wonderful advice because then it's quality, not quantity. Yes. You know, and you're really devoting yourself to one piece to make it your best work instead of just churning out. You, tons can, of you can churn your stuff out. Uh, and we were talking last night about so many of the things involved. Uh, you know, I paint quickly. Mm -hmm. um, now, is that a comparative statement to no. what other people, how quickly? Well, other maybe, people maybe so. I don't know. I paint quickly because I need to. Okay. I enjoy the excitement. Um, the Absolute excitement of beginning and getting into a painting. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it work. Nobody will ever see those things. Uh, and that's an age old thing. Right. Even Michelangelo threw away most of his drawings because he didn't want people to see them. Mm -hmm. That was not the finished work. It was the finished work he was after. Mm -hmm. And that's what people saw. Right. He would sometimes misplace these drawings and people would pick them up or whatever. Or he would produce a drawing that was so fine that he might not even produce the sculpture from it because the drawing was the work. Was the work. And we have, I have discovered that many times that if I produce a drawing that is that kind of quality, I will not make a painting from it. Most of the drawings that I do, I produce. And help me produce a painting. Mm -hmm. It's like your initial idea. Yes. Okay. The initial idea, and I end up not carrying those drawings too far 
of course, if I do, I'll all of a sudden I'll run into uh, mm, maybe I should just keep this and bring it and not do the same thing. Right. Uh, and I think you can see that. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what is your, uh, well, I, I'll save that question. Um, when did you realize, or I don't know if you realize or you decide that you're going to be an artist? This is this is my life's calling. My last year in college. Um, I went to the University of Houston, wonderful school. Uh -huh. I would not go there now because it's like a small city. Right, right, yeah. But uh, my last semester, I went into my counselor and he had me down for 19 hours of academics, French, advanced math, all these things. And I was saying art class. Mm -hmm. And I was, what the hell is this? Yeah. I'm not going to do this. Mm -hmm. And so I did not graduate from college. I couldn't. I can still right, right. What good was it doing? Right. Well, it doesn't seem to have held you back in yeah. either. <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, I became a short order cook from a, for a restaurant down in, in Houston, uh, and uh, I can still cook real, make a good neighbor. But uh, I started applying to street art shows, street mm -hmm. shows, festivals, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And after about a year, I had acquired enough work. That I was able to go into these shows and discover that I could actually make a living selling art and then never turn back. Very good. But fair not, I kept my coming job for a year. Well, yeah. The old, the old thing, don't, don't get a new job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't leave your old don't job. Leave your old job. Yeah, until you have a new one. Anyway, the festival that I applied to. Became of more quality. Uh, but that's another thing that I always talk on. And a lot of times in June, we'll get a lot of college kids come into the studio. Mm -hmm. One of the first questions is, how do I get into a gallery? How do I do this? And, and, and you know, I'm so good. I mean, how am I going to get into a gallery? And, because they're going to tell my work on only things. Right, right. Yeah. And so I say to them, okay, the first thing you need to do. It's been two or three years in street shows. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and oh, makes them all crazy. Right. But we have several friends out of the Cabo Hall of Fame mm -hmm. in Oklahoma City. Uh, and ask any of these people, I don't ask them because I know the answer. Mm -hmm. But they, in talking about their themselves and in interviews like this, they're invariably going to say the same thing. We're just talking. I started with the street show, mm -hmm. selling selling my work in festivals, right? Traveling around, you know, I went as far as St. Louis and 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 uh, you know for a weekend show, come home, paint all week long, leave Friday afternoon, drive all night, get to a show, and so drive back home Sunday night, all over again. It's it's a routine. It is hard, difficult. You have to stay focused, uh, and then, uh, but it, it is a lovely way to learn. I d I d incredible people. Oh yeah, I can even, uh, because there are people like you at these street shows, shows right? Yeah. And so you guys are getting to know each other. Well, I just had this thought, like in the days in France, where the artists would all just be in the streets together, yeah. and everyone yes. hung out together and sold their and how they encouraged each other and you know raised the bar for each other and all that. I mean, it seems like that would be kind of the same thing. It was the kind of the same thing. I, I was not, and still, I'm not much of a social person because uh, after these shows, a lot of times they would all get together and go out and you know. Part of it. Right, right. Well, not part of that. Yeah. Never had time. Mm -hmm. Never had the desire. Oh, sure, you're just getting trouble. Well, you know yourself better than yeah. anybody. So, <laughs> but, but it is a wonderful life, and I would recommend it to anybody who has talent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like some of your people here. Right. Oh, um, so, you're uh, Chickasaw. Uh, did you begin your career? 
you're, a lot of the pieces you have here today are native yes. people in, in the in the art. Did you start out painting with that theme in mind? No. Is that uh, okay? So we're, no. what what were your originals? We we have uh, several paintings. We luckily we have some of them in the house. And during the seventies. I was in what I call my uh, Andrew Wyatt period, <laughs> like everybody was. Right, right. Uh, and, you know, if I could just paint like Wyatt, I'd be rich and famous. Mm -hmm. uh, I did paint a lot like Wyatt, but I never got rich and famous. But it wasn't until, oh, uh, I think in the 80s, mid 80s, early 80s, that I started developing a real interest in my history. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my history, it's the Chickasaw people, uh, and and we were so fortunate over the years to develop a relationship with Governor Anatoly uh, and and a lot of those people down here, uh, and because of him, we did many many paintings of our living elders, Chickasaw elders, not old. Dead elders, photographs, all that. Right. We interviewed Martha and I interviewed these people, and it just became part of my being. Mm -hmm. the, the native culture. Uh, most of the people that are in these paintings are in fact Turkish, uh, but not all. We also have some friends up north where we live, China and Davos, mm -hmm. uh, which gives me an opportunity to. Paint their wonderful regalia, paint their history, mm -hmm. which is so different from Chickasaw history. But it's all very exciting. Right. I have, and I have uh, talked to some other Native artists, and their regalia and, and getting that correct, it was a real, it was, it was a, so important. Um, and when one of, one of the artists, um, his name's Brent Learned. Yes. Uh, anyway, he was saying, um, you know, when you see a piece of art that someone else has created and the regalia is not right or something is not, a, a, they, they identify as a certain tribe, you know, the, that it doesn't match, that that, it, that doesn't set right. Yeah. One thing we learned, and it was, I love going back to school. Mm -hmm. And I say that by, to me, doing still lives, mm -hmm. since we went back to school, basics. Okay. Well, everything is still life. Mm -hmm. It's still life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you do a setup, you get the right light correct, you do all these things, and you have a limited amount of time to paint. Mm -hmm. Flowers don't last all of them. Mm -hmm. You have them for just a little bit. Right. Well, take advantage of that a little bit and listen to your structures from long ago. Mm -hmm. Pay attention, get your mind out of your whatever. Don't think too much, it just gets in the way. Right. right. Just paint what you see. Uh -huh. uh, and so, paint while still I was anyway, while I was going while I go, like I said, we painted all of these paintings of the Chickasaw elders, I think. 72. They're all great mm -hmm. And luckily, we got so involved in their history. Uh, and we interviewed these people. Martha took all the photographs. I ended up doing the paintings. But there was something that had to be there. And that was each of these people. I had to produce a painting that looked exactly like that person. Exactly. Perfect. Perfect. It was difficult. Yeah. And, and it's something we all pursue. We'll never find it. Right. But all we needed was for one of these people to walk through and look at these paintings and say, that doesn't look like her. Mm -hmm. That doesn't look like him. Mm -hmm. Well, he wouldn't wear that. Or mm -hmm. kill the whole thing. So any of these people, uh, and we ran into this again and again, that, that, uh, this took a number of years to do. Right. The family members would come through uh, and become involved with the painting. Mm. Oh, this is my mom. So they would sit around and 
have a conversation with the family. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it was so meaningful uh, to us to see that kind of thing happen. Right. That, that it just showed me that I was on the right track. Exactly. Well, it sounds like you did more than capture an image. Well, you captured the heart, the soul of your, of this, you know, the person, yeah. and, and brought them to life almost for their families. We don't have time for all this, but some of the stories are so incredible that it still knocks us out when we think of it. Oh, right. That some of these evil. There was a little bitty woman. They're by herself out in the country, you know, or south and west of Ada. Uh, and uh, small one, they're by herself. Uh, and and uh, we had been undergoing a draft like we're in right now in, in Oklahoma. We went down to interview her, got her photographs done, uh, and we're leaving. Uh, and we're standing out beside this huge rose bush, which we can't part of her painting. Uh, and and uh, I just asked her, do you think we're going to get any rain? Very long she was small. She looked up at me and said, the tree frogs are singing. It rained before we got home. Really? Wow. Wow. That... Well, that was the name of her painting. Uh, the tree frogs, the tree frogs are, singing. are singing. Uh, and, and it just went on and on. Mm -hmm. Each one of these people have different stories. Some of them were just horribly horrible. They all, all these people went through the same problems back in the 30s, uh, you know, being really poor, depending on the government for what they had, you know, relying on one another, and making sure nobody went hungry, mm -hmm. nobody was left alone, taking care of their neighbor. Right. Like you hear your family, mm -hmm. and, and they all have the same story. Could have been all these seventy-two paintings could have been told by the same person. Do you see? Right. They all were related one way or another. Mm -hmm. They just went on and on. What a wonderful legacy for you to be able to be a part of, and and yeah. you know to perpetuate their stories to give their families a place to go, to remember them, as I'm sure many of them passed now, or, you know, well, they're yes, aged. And, and just what, what a wonderful gift you've left behind. I, I'm sure that you guess the nation just so appreciative. Well, the first thing we did was somebody you know, Earl Scott. Earl Scott, yes. Earl Scott. And that was our first painting that we did of that series. Uh, and I'm so thrilled that she was the first one mm -hmm. to see totally put us at ease. Let us in her house, uh, and usually these interviews would last an hour, right? which is a long time mm -hmm. to be in somebody's home, an elder person. Mm -hmm. But I think we were with her two hours, two hours, uh, and, and we had to force our way out. Right. She wanted to keep talking. Right. Right. But the woman has such a history. Oh, and yeah, she, she is fascinating. She, she was just the beginning of all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't know, one day we'll write a book about it, I guess. Oh, I think you should. Absolutely. So who's going to paint your portrait for, for that? Anybody around here? <laughs> I can do singing. <laughs> Um, I've included myself in some paintings. Sure. I don't think we have one here, do we? You, you can. Yeah, and you did wait the you know. Yeah, but we have one of those here. Yeah. No, it's not here. Okay. Well, how about if we start talking about some of the pieces that you chose for this show? This is called The Journey, or just Journey. It's called Journey. And um, why, did, why did you choose that title yeah. for this? What I'll do is a journey. Okay. Uh, and, and bear in mind, again, I'll go back to Michelangelo. He has been such an influence on my little life, especially our sculptors. Mm -hmm. That on the last day of his life, I think it was 89, something like that, very mm -hmm. he made the statement that he was finally understanding what he spent his life doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Statement. Right. And he was working on a piece while he said that. Right. 
I, I mean, that uh, when, when when you meet someone who just does, they just do what they do with no thought of I'm going to be known for this. I'm going to people are going to see this forever and think it's you know when when those things are not in their minds. Those are the people who seem to leave the most behind, who impact people the most. Well, thanks. So, just like I said, while I go, turn off the thing too much. Right. It just gets just, in the way. Just gets in the way. I, I kind of like to start with this piece right here. So, my dad, when my dad and I came to your studio to pick these up, this one, uh, my dad said, those are World War I helmets on those guys. And um, so then I was very intrigued. This one is called the Chickasaw, I mean, the Choctaw Co, Co Talkers World War I, which I I love because I think we talked about you don't you don't hear people talking about co talkers from World War I. And um, so tell us a little bit about this piece. Well, this is. We're working on code talkers, but and here's a guy over here who has his mask, mm -hmm. yeah, and we try this just for code to make sure the things were correct, like the bags that get on the cross, the rifles were correct, mm -hmm. and all these things. Uh, and and uh, the amazing thing about the code talkers was it all happened by accident. You're aware of that. Sure. No. Not with the World War One. I, I really don't know anything about this. A, a uh, an officer uh -huh. woke by somewhere I can't remember exactly and heard That's two good. Indians who talked about talking to one another. And he made the connection for possibility. And he asked them, are there other people around to speak your language mm -hmm. because he couldn't understand them. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are some in the office over there will law. Can you call them and give them a message I'm going to give you? They did. Do you see how that right, happened? Right. Then developed into the code talkers and this saved so many thousands of lives. Mm -hmm. I cannot even mm -hmm. imagine. Right. I mean, people were tired because lost. this was a this was a language that no one in Europe no. could break. I can't. Right. Supposed to understand it. Right. Uh, and <clears throat> so you know, I had this high river from the Choctaw people, but the Choctaws and the Chickasaws are mm -hmm. heard now together, mm -hmm. with some exceptions, of course. Right. But. Uh, and we discovered that there are two or three Chickasaw people back then, that long time ago, were very famous. But they joined with these people called, because back then, Chickasaw Choctaws spoke pretty much the same language. Again, with some differences. But uh, we concentrated on the Choctaw because uh, that's what the history says, and that's what is taught mm -hmm. somewhere, hopefully. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, at least it it starts a piece like this is going to get someone's attention and they're going to think, wait a minute, and do some looking into it, you know, if that if, if, if you don't learn about it any other way, at least that's what yeah. this will do. Well, here we have the Choctaw code questions. <clears throat> we have a couple of three warriors. Right. Four. Uh -huh. uh, and we also have a man doing a blessing. Okay. Like a shaman. Uh -huh. a holy man. Right. A warrior over there. I mean, they're all warriors, but this is what I want to concentrate on. Mm -hmm. So these are in the forefront. They're in the forefront. They're bigger, mm -hmm. uh, and and you look at it, you know what they're doing. Right. But uh, I don't know. It's it's, it's such an outstanding event. Mm -hmm. I just had to, mm -hmm. and took quite a while to do. There are quite a few drawings. You may have seen some of the drawings. I did. Of, yes. Of this that I was working on to develop this painting. But here again, it all had to be correct with with mm -hmm. the dress and. And so I think one other thing I'm gathering from this uh, talk is <laughs> there's a lot of work done behind the scenes. You said you don't think about it, 
whenever you don't, don't think too much when you're painting, but you've already done all the research. So you you know you need to get some things act some things have to be very accurate. Some, you know, there there are things that have to be precise in what you're making. Yeah. Um, but but you've done all that work ahead of time. So if you're creating something historical or connected to a specific group of people, right? There was a guy that talked to me last night. Uh-huh. Lovely man. <laughs> uh, did not get his name. Maybe I did. But uh, right, right, yeah. I'm remembering memories. <laughs> not the best. <laughs> but anyway, he crowd in the next room. I want to talk to you about this photography painting. Okay. <laughs> you know those men in that painting for army. Well, I picked up really quickly that this military mm -hmm. elder mm -hmm. was an officer. Right. So you see. Right. Uh -huh. Yes, I understand that. Well, you understand also that the Marines were part of that. I am a Marine. Yes, sir. <laughs> right. He didn't dress me down or anything. Right, right. But you could pretty much tell that, that he was an officer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but he was happy with the painting when I explained to him what was going on. Mm -hmm. I understand the Marines were part of this. You know, all the branches were part of it. Right. It had to include everybody, all the branches of the military. Mm -hmm. I portrayed the Army. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he just wanted to be sure you knew, I guess. Yes. Yeah. But, and, you know, like, anyway. Yeah. Well, and, but that's, I mean, that's another reason why you have to, you have to do the work. You yeah. need to know the, the research. Another fellow was asking me last night, my big year dad, uh -huh. that, uh, you know, how do you come up with all these colors? And how do you do this? And how do you do that? Yeah, and no, it was that large fellow that was with the TV. Oh, uh, Justin, Justin, John, SWO. John, yes, very tall guy. Giant guy with a lovely tattoo. Uh -huh. uh, he was asking me in our little TV interview, so I see it, yeah. Right. That, uh, how do you do this? How do you do that? And uh, do you remember the movie Little Big Man? Yes. You've seen it? I've seen it. Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman. Uh -huh. Do you remember the little bitty scene where Dustin Hoffman is talking to his sister and she is teaching him to shoot? Uh huh. Okay. You know okay. Draw and shoot. Uh -huh. She says to him, draw a pistol and, and shoot before you touch the pistol. And he said, What are you talking about? Right. Same thing with paintings. Uh, I know what that painting's going to look like before I put it on the canvas. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. You it's it's here. You've got it up here. You put it up there, but you don't think about it. Mm -hmm. It was an image. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, again, there there are other things too that I try my best not to carry a painting too far. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're familiar with. Uh, now the whole weavings. Yes. Y'all might have some here. Mm -hmm. Well, we have some bead work. I don't okay. know that we have any. Well, place. anyway, these women make these rugs and strive for perfection. Mm -hmm. They'll finish this carpet weaving, and before they put it out for sale, they'll pull a stitch. So it will not be perfect. Mm -hmm. That's not for them to do. You see, they'll make sure only God proves is perfect. Mm -hmm. They can. Mm -hmm. So they will close oh, this. Yes. I do that. Ah. And, and so do we all. Mm -hmm. You carry a painting too far, it's not worth looking at. Right. Right. It's I mean, and you've seen these paintings that are painted edge to edge. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. oh, it was making me tired. Right. Right. Well, um, I mean, you do the, your backgrounds are, most of the time, they're kind of a, a they're a blank, a, they're a color, mostly. but they're mostly blank, and so um, there's not a lot of things there to distract from right. your focus. You want to focus on something. Uh, right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, 
even as it's, it's expanding here, you know, I could have carried it so much further. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, yeah, this one is more of an exception, I, I mean, guess. But there are things back like here like smoke, mm -hmm. possibly coming from our artillery, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. But if I could have carried it so much further, putting the implements back there, tanks and weapons and all kinds of stuff. Right, right. That would have simply distracted from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You put too many things in the painting, uh, and and I hate it when I see people look at a painting and look around and oh look at this and look at that and oh come here, look at that. you know, right? Stand back and look at the painting and look at it. Yes, and move on. Right, right. That's what. So when my mom came in last night, she was looking at a piece over there, and she said, "Oh look, you can get out of the lines." <laughs> 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 and I thought that was just so funny when it's very cute that she said that. But I mean, that's one thing that it softens what you've made. It's and it it takes that perfection off, yes. you know. But it still allows you to stand back and see everything. Your eyes do the make the lines and all of that for you. So I do get out lines a lot. Uh, and I think I did that when I was a kid. And my stepdad always was always jumping on me. Right, right. It is mm -hmm. like the fact that I was the youngest anyway. So well, one, one made it one of the insurance was Well, there's, there's something that you can make a dollar in. Right, right. So, it well, turns out, fine. yeah, turns out it, it worked out just fine for you. <laughs> so, uh, how about if we're, we'll kind of pull some pieces over and put them on this easel okay. instead of walking around? And I, I really wanted to start this. This was my husband's very favorite okay. one. This is called Headrest of Clouds. I'll let you stand okay. closer to okay. it. Um, and I can paint. I yeah. think you can see why. Right. And we have done two or three of these paintings. Uh -huh. We're uh, a headrest that become part of the kind of skyscape. Right. DC. Uh -huh. And that happened by accident, uh -huh. quite frankly. Uh -huh. There have been, been many headdresses that were red. Uh, you know, they're not always white. They were dyed them red, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, and I love this color. It's called Mikey Red. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do too. It's beautiful. Kathy and Leonard Rock. And we, we read that with Mikey Red. Mikey Red, because it's his, your favorite. <laughs> yeah. And this is my hand friend. Ah. So, and are, are these uh, Chickasaw? Actually, no. This okay. is more plain straw. Okay. The Chickasaw did not wear headdresses. Okay. Uh, they, you know, as they came out here to Oklahoma, the Chickasaw was developed. So a lot of the things that the plains tribes have done for jillion years. Right. Like the drums. Mm -hmm. uh, we love the drums. Martha loves going into a room down and paid up with the drumming. Yes. It is captivated yes yes uh, and, and like that but that is not typical to woodlands people okay it's a plains effect uh -huh. the heavy drumming mm -hmm. you know sitting around the room right. Doing the thing. right we had it's some like we had some uh kiowa dancers uh come one time for trail talk and we had a, yes. a drummer just and then we had some uh dancers outside and they, they had a group of three um doing the drums and i I love it that each one of those drum beats, it's actually a song. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who was a woman uh, buckskin dancer, female buckskin dancer, and we would listen to her, the beaver song, the bear song, all of these songs on a cassette tape. This was a long time ago. And um, I said, I don't know how you hear the difference, you know, but I, I probably you listen long enough. Very, very song. Yeah, yeah, but it, I loved it. Yeah. Loved listening and, to this. The, these plains peoples, the coyotes, and all these peoples out here identify so much with the subtleties mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they can they can tell a drum to you and me doesn't change all that much, but they can determine subtly mm -hmm. when a drum beat might miss a beat, mm -hmm. misses a beat because. Mm -hmm. What is it portraying? Somebody or some event, something? Oh, you see? Really? Wow. It, it's like a telegram. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, the, the uh, 
That's one, one of our biggest blessings in doing the painting as well. These elders were when some of these women would sing to us at the end of our little interview. They would start singing in chick songs. Well, we didn't understand what they said. Right. And one of our one of our interviews was with the a man who was a preacher in a church. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, he has such a wonderful story, oh, Charlie. Uh, and he prayed over us. Mm -hmm. When we were all through, we had no circle, mm -hmm. and he prayed over us in Chickasaw. Well, of course, didn't understand what he said, but I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's that drumbeat. Oh, you see, yes, same a thing. beautiful way to explain. Same that. thing. Wow. Uh, and and uh, he had such a beautiful story. His life was nearly ruined by drinking. Mm. Uh, and, and his wife, with a calm word to him when he came in one night, mm -hmm. calm word. Right. She didn't cuss him, mm -hmm. yell at him, whip him, anything. Mm. Gave him a calm word, mm. and he stopped. Wow. Uh, and, and he had before that a better preacher in English. Mm -hmm. And so he, after he recovered, went back to preaching in the church. But he discovered a whole lot of old men back in the very back row, leaning against the wall, because mm -hmm. they didn't understand English. So he started preaching in uh, Texas, uh, and their heads came up. Wow, Isn't that, amazing? that is that is really amazing. And and we have a couple of things that he made. The bow, he was a renowned bow maker. We have one of his bows. Oh wow! Uh, and, and we think about him a lot because it was so important mm -hmm. to us. Right. So did the did the Chickasaw people or the uh, did the Choctaw people when they came? Did they um, did they have dances and other instruments that they? Sure, they and both. They always dance. They always. Many dance. people have always danced, mm -hmm. uh, and the Chicksaws dance also, but they did not have what you would call a powwow. Okay. They had gatherings uh -huh. when they were over, over in the east. Uh -huh. But like I said, when they came out to Oklahoma. They adopted so many things because of the surrounding tribes. Mm -hmm. One thing about Indian people is they see something pretty, they'll adopt it. They'll adopt it. Yeah. yeah. Their dress changed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no, totally. They maintain, you know, what their, their history. Mm -hmm. But they, you know, see something pretty, especially the women. Right. See something pretty, they would adopt it. Mm -hmm. you know, nothing wrong with it. Right. Instead of making it a big, oh, that's very different. Yeah. It was more like, I, I like that. Why don't yeah. we just, yeah. Um. So, uh, what was your inspiration then? Would you say for this piece? The clouds. The clouds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the clouds first. Mm -hmm. uh, and we luckily live out in the country. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so we're able to see the sunrise. Mm -hmm. More than that, we're able to see what happens before the sun rises. Mm -hmm. And those few seconds before the sun rises. But right. But because right. when the sun comes up, all the colors are Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so Martha and I are both coffee drinkers in the morning. And so mm -hmm. we sat out on the front porch, which faces the east, watch the sun mm -hmm. rise. Uh, and, and so Martha shoots these, these things. And you can picture oh, that right, yes. in the seconds, maybe a minute before the sun came up uh -huh. and, and took the color away. I don't know where it takes it. But I don't know either. I don't know. It decides to bring it back just before it goes down at night. <laughs> Gives us that little shot. Um, so is there another piece you'd like us to talk about? I kind of like this, uh, the dream. The, which, which one? Dance, yeah, yeah. You get that. You want to bring that one over here, Blake, please, please. The long one. Uh huh. Oh. Yeah, I I really love that one. I'm gonna step over here. Take this thing on real fast. Let's see. Okay. Let's see how this goes.
in, yeah. in your sin. Yeah, she, she, I, uh -huh. yeah, she's got it on there pretty well. Visitor, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one I really loved. So it's tell not, us about it. Well, this is called Dream of Visitors. Uh -huh. uh, and, and you can see you have this one character, which is the presence. All the people's in the background have little definition. Mm -hmm. They're like in a fog. Mm -hmm. Those are ancestors. Okay. Come to this man in his dreams. Uh -huh. All the way back to the one on the very far left. Can you see him? You can see by kind of what he is wearing. Right. And by the shape of his head. Uh -huh. He goes really, really far back. Uh, okay. He also had some like Face. I don't know if it would be just yes, me or tattoos. Tattoos in face. Okay. Very common and, and uh, very old. Still, not not too much facial facial tattoos. Mm -hmm. But in the old days, facial tattoos were really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and we watch a TV program where one of the most important characters is Eskimo woman mm -hmm. with the tattoos on her chin. Mm -hmm. Very old, mm -hmm. old style. Mm -hmm. And so this is like kind of through the ages then, as ancestors yes. way, back, way back and then coming nearer. Your ancestors are new. Uh -huh. We interviewed this woman. Ah. And, and so she has gone now. Uh -huh. And some of these things like the uh, hand. Right. The open hand with the eye. Uh -huh. you're, you're familiar with that. Right, the yes. Uh -huh. It's very woodlands. Oh. Uh, and, We've seen or read many, many definitions of what that means. Mm -hmm. The eye of God, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, the all-seeing eye, and and all yeah, of those things. Kind of uh -huh. uh, and this man right here, uh, he has since died. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, two, three. Mm -hmm. huh? two years. Yeah, two years, three. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite, favorite autumn moments. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and we I have written somewhere I don't remember where that he has such an ancient face mm -hmm. and demeanor mm -hmm. that if I were to come across him in the woods mm -hmm. forest mm -hmm. and he was dressed in the old style right I would have my hand on my pistol. <laughs> You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, we have a sculpture piece <laughs> over at the Chickasaw Cultural Center, and he has a big part of the sculpture. But uh, it was perfect for him to be the one mm -hmm. in full color. Mm -hmm. uh, and I painted these people back here in the back without color. You yeah. can see that. Right. Because color brings you to the surface. Mm -hmm. Right. I love this piece. Ask you a question because I noticed this last night in several of your pieces. The hands are big. Bigger, yeah. We were talking about this last night. That that uh, when I went, I went to the University of Houston for a reason. Okay. Uh, and I love sculpture. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were in Amarillo. There was nothing available except for a, a sculptor guy who would remain nameless. He was quite a Oh. Anyway, went to Houston. Uh, and here's this wonderful sculptor. I think he was from uh, DC. Mm -hmm. Going to be out there for a year. Uh, and he had us study daily the photographs and study Michelangelo and Rodin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both of those sculptors, their hands were just a little too big. Can you picture the young David that Michelangelo did? Yes. The hand is just a touch too big. Uh -huh. Ro Rodin did the same thing, except to excess sometimes. Uh, but anyway, all of our students develop pieces uh -huh. of sculpture uh -huh. with hands that were too big. Uh, and I had to calm down my mind down some time too, <laughs> because the hands were so big that they. You know, uh -huh. anyway, calm down. 
start producing things. Now, I still have one of those. I think maybe Bobby sold it. I don't know. Anyway, that uh, I continue with that in structure. Uh -huh. But that idea also flowed into the paintings when I was painting people. Uh -huh. The idea of the hands being a little too big mm -hmm. worked. Uh, and there's another aspect to that, and it has to do with photography. Mm -hmm. My hand is the same size as my face. Right. So is your same yeah. size as your face. Yeah. Like how big my hand is compared to my face. Uh -huh. You see? Uh -huh. So in a painting, with the hand being a little too big, it creates an immediate feeling of depth mm -hmm. in a painting without doing anything. Right. Wow, that's and so smart. I without thinking about it. Uh -huh. I mean, like look at that painting yonder, it's almost as though you can put your hand behind his. Yes. And there's space between that hand and his body. Do you see? I do. I so do see that. What you ah. It works. That is very cool. I'm so glad you explained that because I really have been curious about that. <laughs> so is that's it, my most old question. Is it really? That's funny. So uh what's what's another one you want us you'd like for us to uh, talk about or you'd like us to talk about? Martha, that little painting back there of the roses. Oh, Mr. Lincoln. the Mr. Lincoln. Okay, let me bring. I'll go get that. <laughs> that one or this one? That one. Okay. The red one. Yeah. Yeah. Near collision. Yeah. Our, um, easel. Oh, look at this one there. That's, that looks fantastic. But like we get in on that one. I got a lot of questions about this one. This really? One, a painting. Yeah. Does it have a name, sweetheart? I need a little more. Seventeen. Yeah. Seventeen. Yeah. We have uh, Martha Grows the Roses. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> well, it's it's we, just lovely, really. We have a large bush outside our front door. So Mr. Lincoln Rose uh -huh. is 17 years old. And we nearly lost it last winter. Uh-huh. Wasn't it last winter? A couple of winters ago. A couple of winters ago. It was so cold for so long that a lot of the bush died, but it came back. Uh, and it is taller. It's seven feet tall. Seven feet tall. Wow. So is it is it just taller or does it bush too? It bushes, but not as much. This particular uh -huh. hybrid is um, not as bushy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it was one of the first rows of bushes we planted in 2005. And it's the only one that's here. Wow. And it gets to be as tall as it wants to be. Because and this is much one of those paintings I was talking to all ago about going back to school. Yes. Yeah. Bring this wonderful plant and light it, paint it. Mm -hmm. It may have taken them up. Really? It may have taken 45 minutes. But you have to bear in mind, you have to know what's going to look like after, mm -hmm. unless you, you know, screw up and destroy it. Right. Which happens. Yeah. But, uh, the the uh, brushwork I like it, uh, the entire thing I like about the little bitty painting. But it was like going back to school for me. Mm. Just uh, kind of pra re practicing those basic. Yeah, and it has good. It. it has good paint quality. Uh, and this is a point school in New York. Okay. At the Art Students League, okay. and I went up there for a reason. The paintings that I was doing back in the 70s, late 70s, my Andrew Wilde period, mm -hmm. were very flat. A lot of scrubbing of the brush to get an effect, this right. one, that, and the other. Uh, and I spent a couple of days, again, out of the National Capital Hall of Fame in City, sitting on a bench looking at paintings by Edgar Payne. Mm -hmm. uh, Couple of people like that went to the home and discovered what I was missing was paint quality. Mm -hmm. Paint quality. 
uh, and most people won't have a clue what that means. You do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what I went there for. As soon as I got an idea of what it was about, I came home. And like we talked about last night, it's a good thing I didn't stay up there because my painting style would have changed. Right, right. I had some very strong willed instructors. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and uh, the great, the best of all those painters in the, the old style, the Rembrandt style, mm -hmm. that black style. Yes. Wonderful. We have a couple of those paintings that I did up there that are nice paintings, mm -hmm. very dark. Splashes of light and color, mm -hmm. which are you know wonderful. On their own, it was not what I was after. Mm -hmm. What I was after, I'm getting close to with what we have here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll never get there. Which will be okay. Well, you know, I think that that's something I've discovered. In the artist is you're never really just going to be satisfied with where you are now. You're always kind of pushing and stretching yourself. Oh, something uh, I haven't talked to them, <laughs> but we went to a demonstration <clears throat> in Oslo. We watched the nameless artist. Okay. And I was asking him, "Where do you think? What do you think you'll be doing in say ten years?" Well, what do you mean? Well, are you going to change or improve what you're doing? And he said, well, "Mark, I can't get any better than I am." Wow. We didn't go to the demonstration. Yeah. We came home. Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, I the the people that I've talked to keep take making things they're fresh. They, you know, it allows them to get back to the basics and then go for something different. There's a challenge involved. I don't know, everyone I've talked to, that is something they feel like makes them better mm -hmm. as artists. Is that willingness to try something new or yeah. just push or stretch themselves, however you want to phrase that. If I might make a comparison, Martha is one of the best cooks mm -hmm. ever. The reason she is, mm -hmm. she will take the recipe and it never ends up that way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tweak this or adjust that or add this or add that. And it's always better. Right, right. Painting is the same, same, same thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um what is your favorite medium? My favorite medium mm -hmm. to paint with? Mm -hmm. Well, I painted acrylics. Okay. Uh, do, you like, do you like that because the, they dry quickly? They or? dry quickly, and like I said, I paint quickly. Right. Uh, and, and so painting in acrylics allows me to do that because you can do overlays, overlays, overlays mm -hmm. many times in a day. Right. With oils, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in the uh, when I went up to New York, there was a requirement. The requirement was you will paint in oils. Okay, I did. And I'm allergic to oils. So I spent the whole time I was up there with swollen face and, oh, uh, and, and itchy ears. Yeah. Uh, I could not wait to get on. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I love the way oil paints smell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually like the smell of turpentine. Which is bizarre. <laughs> Each his own. <laughs> but uh, uh, like I said, I was glad to get home. Right. Uh, and get back into my acrylic paints. Uh -huh. um, so do you want to talk about another one of your, uh, the people that, uh, or what about, you brought a couple of landscapes. Yeah. Didn't you? Mm -hmm. I, I think so. The what? The team. Pretty much back there in the corner. This with the live one, yeah, I think so. the one in the corner there, back in the corner, yes, yeah. back in the, the class. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I cut it. Thank you, ma'am. This is going to just give people a little idea of what all kinds of pieces they're going to be able to see when they come here. Because we're counting on you coming. Okay. 
So is this a location well, a, or? This is down on this little bit of piece of, piece of land we have. Uh -huh. uh, and, and like us kind of like what we were talking about before a while ago, shooting a skyscape in those seconds before the sun comes up. Right. These cloud paintings are pretty much the same. And just a few minutes time, this little cloudscape would have been different. Mm -hmm. Moved on, maybe died. You know, clouds, clouds are wonderful things. I love clouds. Right. But the development of this little dark area in front of this larger area behind it. Yes. Or have gone away so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Martha's always had on the front porch with her phone, which is our best camera. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and this line of trees, well, it's just on our place mm -hmm. that we look at Easter or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and bam, it's just there. There it is. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there have been, uh, you may know some of these people. Oh, I don't take photographs. I don't take photographs. I don't do my paintings from photographs. Mm -hmm. I do my paintings from live nature. Mm -hmm. They're lying. Uh, Even one of the best paintings, painters in our country's history was Nikolai Christian. Uh -huh. Used photographs. Mm -hmm. Photographs of people. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Right, Nothing. right. But photography is a tool of love. Mm -hmm. Just like a really good brush. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and uh, you know, our little cameras, our little phones now are so good. They are, yeah. That that yeah. when you're able to capture something like this, well, why not just leave it as a photograph? Yeah. Why not paint it? I'm like paint it. <laughs> paint it's what I think. Yeah, paint paint is what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, you know, I paint seven days a week. Do you really? Well, of course, we're going to church. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you spend some time at your studio in the afternoon. Huh? Every day. Every day. Uh, and and uh, that was a preference. Um, I enjoy the studio. Mm -hmm. We built it out on a place that nobody's been there with me. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have to smell other people or put up the uh, anything that other people might have done <laughs> right, right. downtown. When when we first moved up to Perkins, it was downtown, old building, uh -huh. two story building <laughs> that had been built in 1903. Right, yeah. And it showed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it was built as a bar. So in the afternoon, when it got hot, mm -hmm. It was still smell of bar. Ah. And the cigarette smoke, the cigar smoke, mm -hmm. sweaty people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't wait to get out there. Some, some of those things you just can't get rid of. You just can't. And we discovered we we're spending a fortune on utilities. Right. Well, on this old building, it was not built to last 100 years. Yeah. So yeah. there's that. Well, um, I think I think if you guys have been able to see some of the just a, just a hint of what we have here at the Heritage Center. I mean, my goodness, Mike, you've just selected so many beautiful pieces to share with us down here. And uh, I just, I'm, I, I have loved getting to know Mike and Martha, just the little bit of time I've been able to spend with them and just seeing uh, the, the pieces and, being in your gallery, I mean, your studio, that was really insightful as well. And um, just, just seeing where someone does their creating, you know, I mean, that's it's kind of an energy in there. And uh, that's that was just, that was wonderful to be able to see that. I'm so glad that you guys were able to come here and I appreciate you being on Trail Talk today. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So Martha, are you going to come on screen? And, uh, now, now that the, we're gonna, it seems we're, like we're going to be getting off here soon. Yeah. Come on here. Here we go. There she is. Hi guys. Yeah. So this is Martha Larson. Martha, who um, was an artist in her own right. And now she helps Mike um, with doing all the, the kind of behind the scenes. Manager. She's the project manager. 
and she uh, helps him. He's, he has a book that uh, he's written, written called Precisely at Noon. At Precisely At noon. Precisely Noon. Sorry, At Precisely Noon. And um, it's about the land run. So uh, it's, it's a great little historical book. And uh, we have some of those here in our gift shop as well. And uh, so we're just very excited to, yeah, for all of this. This has really, really been very fun. Um, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Were you going to say something else? No. No. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm so. Better, better no. Yeah. We'll have to speak again for a week. <laughs> He's all talked out. They will have a silent <laughs> ride back to Perth. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you guys so much. Please come by and uh, see what uh, Mike's created and uh, has here at this show. And um, look, look up Mike Larson and you can see the, he's, he's left his mark in our state, not just at the Chickasaw Cultural Center, but at our state capitol, the campus of Oklahoma State University. Yeah, he, you may have seen recently on the news, there is a monument uh, Burns Hargis, who's the former president, uh, right, he's just, he just retired. Yes. Yeah, uh, former president of Oklahoma State University, and uh, they commissioned Mike to create that statue. I even went to see the mock ad. It was so cool. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so he's, he's really um, just, we're just so fortunate to have uh, his work here and just look him up and I think you'll be very blown away and uh, come by Duncan to the Chisholm Trail Heritage Center and see uh, what we have and thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we always say happy trails. Whenever happy, we sign trails. Up, so you guys are happy trails. Happy trails. <laughs> happy trails.